Okay. Um, Jelani here. He's a recent transplant from Michigan to Emory, and he's an expert in lymphatic interventions, and he's going to give us a case-based approach here. So, and he's also our new IR fellowship director for any potential applicants. Thanks, Arthi. Uh, we're going to show lymphatics from a couple different ways with a lot of clinical questions um, to help um, you troubleshoot on particular issues that may arise. Yeah. Mm. Oh. So case one, um, I'm just going to read these out and uh, direct the questions to those who are uh, here uh, locally. So we have a 63-year-old male who's um, had a right lower lobectomy for lung cancer. On post-op uh, day three, they started feeding him. Um, all of a sudden, the chest tube that was still there, the output started increasing and the color of the fluid changed. And this is what the fluid that came out looked like. The patient has made NPO and the output decreases. So what should the fluid be tested for to confirm or exclude the possibility of chylothorax? Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. So ah. <laughs> right. So um, neutrophils, triglycerides, lipase, amylase, or phone a friend. I know we zoomed forward a little bit, so I'm going to give the people a pass. And actually, it's triglycerides. Um, triglycerides are actually the most uh, specific, along with chylomicrons, for chylothorax, which is described initially in the 1630s. Uh, when you have a triglyceride level above 110, it's um, very uh, sensitive and specific for a chylothorax. And if it's less than 50, similarly, that has a very high negative predictive value for a chylothorax. Um, the only thing that I'll say is if somebody's completely NPO, they may not have triglycerides that are leaking in the fluid, um, and you should test the fluid when they're eating. So, I have a question already. Yes. <laughs> so um, does all of the lymphatics throughout the body have this triglycerides? Or, for example, say you have a lymphatic malformation in your leg, it wouldn't have triglycerides, right? That is an amazing and very, very smart question. Someone clearly look at the presentation. Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> We'll quickly about lymphatic okay. anatomy. Um, and lymphatic circulation and lymphatic contents are, are not uniform throughout the body. You know, we think of blood as being the same throughout the body, whether it's in um, the leg or the heart or the brain. Um, arterial blood is arterial blood, venous blood is venous blood. You know, there's some differences in electrolytes and oxygen concentration, but lymphatics are completely different. You have three distinct lymphatic circulations. Um, you have the peripheral lymphatics, uh, which only produce about 20% of the lymphatic fluid in the body. And that's what we think of in terms of like the Starling equation and oncotic pressure, where things are ultra filtered into the lymphatics in return. This is actually very nutrient poor fluid and is actually lymphocyte rich. So this does not have triglycerides in it. So if you have a lymphocele, for instance, it's not going to necessarily have triglycerides in, in it the same way that a chylothorax would. Fluid that comes from the liver is very different from fluid that would come from the small intestines. Both are nutrient rich, but the fluid in the liver is going to be protein rich because that's essentially where your albumin is produced and will be returned through the lymphatics back to the central venous circulation via the thoracic duct. And finally, the small bowel lymphatics are going to be uh, rich with fat droplets, uh, primarily triglycerides, etc., that are metabolized and absorbed in a different pathway than things going to the portal venous system and similarly get returned to the thoracic duct. So these circulations each have different lymphatic contents in them, um, but come together at the thoracic duct with somewhere around L1 that continues up to the uh, chest and delivers it back to the venous circulation. So case one continued. Um, what treatments are available for this patient? Octreotide, thoracic duct ligation, lymphangiography and thoracic duct embolization, being an interventionalist, hint, hint, um, mm -hmm. NPO slash TPN status, or all of the above? We say all of the above. At that one. is exactly right. Sorry, did it go for it? Yeah. So that is exactly right. And some of this is guided by, the, the treatment should be guided by the output. 
if the output is less than 500 and frankly less than 250 cc's, putting the patient on NPO or TPN plus minus octreotide may actually uh, slow and stop the leak completely over a period of a couple of weeks. If that leak is over 500 cc's a day, if it's been going on for longer than two weeks, then you need to do something more aggressive to not allow the patient to deteriorate. Um, some of that's going to be guided by low expertise. If you don't have somebody who does them have decreased morbidity and mortality for patients with a faster turnaround. We have, exactly. a we have a question. <laughs> Let's hear it. This is Roger. He's one of our interventional radiologists. Hey, how's it going? Uh, thanks for this. I wanted to know, when would you give a triotide? I haven't really given that. And what situations would you give? Because I used to do this first line TPO, like TPN first or NPO first, but I never really thought about giving a triotide. You know what situations you would and would not give a triotide with the NPO? There's, there's actually very few situations that I don't give octreotide. Um, I will go maximal therapy on the conservative side. Um, I think there's very few, if any, side effects to giving the long-acting octreotide and hoping that it will help. And if it helps, wonderful. If it doesn't help, I think no harm done. Um, but if we're going to go the conservative route, I'm going to maximize it before we do something uh, more aggressive. How does it help? It decreases the splanchnic uh, oh, circulation. Good. So it's going to have less circulation going through it and hopefully will help dry it out. There are some entities that it tends to be more effective for. Um, in the traumatic setting, um, I'm not so sure that it makes a big difference. If you have a big leak, it's not going to change. If you have a small leak, it may help. Um, I wouldn't swear by it, per se, but I always use it in conjunction. Um, so adult chylothorax, depending on where you're at, um, the etiology uh, for it will be very different. If you're at a center that does a lot of esophagectomies, lung cancer resections, cardiovascular surgeries, you're going to see more traumatic chylothorax than not. Historically, malignancy such as lymphoma and lung cancer um, certainly used to account for the majority. And uh, when you look at the literature now, I think a lot of it is based on uh, where you practice and referral patterns of what you'll see. Um, but this is the same patient. And uh, go next one. so, sorry, uh, um, there was actually a leak here in the right lung base. The codex just not working but um, a very flagrant leak in the right lung base from this lobectomy. We were able to get in with a, a 21 gauge needle past our wire, and then we place, place a fairly dense coil pack extending down close to our access site, and then we used some glue just to seal it shut and make sure that the um, spaces between the coils were uh, completely closed. This is actually a fairly robust treatment, accepted and fairly widely available. Um, there have been several large series on it. Um, dating back to 2004 with the first uh, large series of 42 patients. Uh, most recently, there's a meta-analysis of 400 plus patients that came out in 2018 as well with a pooled uh, effectiveness of about 82%, uh, uh, give or take. Um, you know, I think in experienced hands, um, expecting uh, traumatic chylothorax to be in the 90 plus percent range is not unheard of. And uh, non-traumatic chylothorax would be a little bit lower in the neighborhood of 80% with the etiology really driving the um, effectiveness. And there are appropriate criteria for it as well, and we do break it up with traumatic versus non-traumatic etiologies. With the traumatic etiology, and, and in this one particular image, I'm only showing the ones that are usually appropriate. So if it's not in this image, it's not considered usually appropriate. Um, chest x-rays, um, obviously fairly commonly used. Lymphane geography, plus minus embolization, um, helpful. Um, in both situations, particularly if you're going to try a minimally invasive um, treatment. Um, in the non-traumatic etiology, um, MRIs as well as uh, CT chest um, uh, and abdomen uh, with contrast are helpful to exclude venous issues. Um, the MRI is really helpful to potentially map out the lymphatics. And I'm going to just show you some examples of what the MRI imaging would be like um, and how it would be helpful. Let me try to uh, shrink Sorry. this down. Sorry. Just make it disappear. Thank you. So we're sharing our screen. So I'll show you a non-contrast MR uh, lymphangiogram. Um, this was historically done when I was a, a trainee. Less so now, but um, there are many techniques that you can actually um, see the lymphatics pretty well. We primarily use a fat spin T2 with fat sap. It's going to really show you the signal difference between slow moving fluid and uh, soft tissue. Uh, lymphatic anatomy, lymphedema, cirrhosis, malformations is really going to pop out because these are all basically dilated uh, lymphatic vessels and stagnant flow. So it's non-invasive, it has good spatial resolution, but 
you're not going to see small things, and there's no info uh, on the flow dynamics. Thank you. <laughs> so um, these are just some examples from when I was a trainee at uh, Brigham and Women's, and you see uh, this uh, was basically a thoracal lumbar MR. Um, the sequences are basically going to be fast spin echoes uh, with and without fat sat uh, T2, and um, fairly thick, I think, you know, when you think of five millimeter with intersection gaps of one uh, to get these images. And you'll see that we have uh, the thoracic duct in this adjacent to the aorta um, in front of the spine. It goes to the aortic hiatus along with the esophagus. This is why spinal surgery, aortic surgery, um, esophageal surgeries can have this as a complication because this uh, particular structure can be damaged. Dynamic and Marlin fan geography came along in 2016, and basically we're going to inject dilute gadolinium via the lymph nodes and get dy dynamic flow information in addition to the resolution that we would get from um, expected from MR of soft tissues. So this is very useful for procedure planning, non-traumatic chylothorax, complicated leaks, and uh, lymphatic flow disorders. Just to show you, this was a congenital uh, Kyla Society's uh, patient that I was taking care of at the University of Michigan. We do our uh, lymphangiogram, and you see in this case, there's direct flow from the lymph nodes up to the thoracic duct. Um, with no leak or otherwise, there was no procedure that we needed to do. In this case, this is normal. Um, contradistinction, here's another patient with Kyla uh, Society's congenitally, and we do our injection. You see robust, huge leak into the peritoneum. Um, this, this child's going to need an intervention and also had surgery afterwards. This was an extensive lymphatic malformation that was discovered. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so you just inject it in the MRI scanner? So um, different places have different protocols in regards to safety. If you go to UPenn, um, they'll actually leave the needles in the lymph nodes and yeah. um, inject directly in the MR. There is a way that you can actually hook it up to even power injectors and do a slow injection. Or um, some places will place an angiocath um, outside of the MR and just leave the uh, catheter portion inside the lymph node and then um, inject it um, after you do your planar sequences and your scouts, um, inject it, and then do time-resolved uh, imaging. And these are injections into the groin nodes? Correct. Okay. And, and how long do you wait before you can see all of that? Uh, in a normal person, it actually will go fairly quickly. Um, you know, literally within minutes, it'll be up to the thoracic duct in a normal person. Oh, wow. uh, we also have a question. When you inject, do you, do you use like sonar guidance to make sure that the needle is actually in the lymph node? Uh, I'm sorry. How do, how do you ensure that you're actually inside so, the lymph node? So yes, we use ultrasound guidance. Um, you can also use ultrasound contrast to uh, confirm the position um, outside the MR base. Some places also will go and confirm it fluoroscopically and transfer the patient on the on the MR bed um, back to the MR. It depends on your setup and what type of MR scanners. If you have uh, beds that can go out to the waiting area or you know wherever, some place that you can bring an ultrasound or not. Um, the, the setup is really gonna be dependent on what you have available. <clears throat> okay, so this is obviously a leak. I'm just gonna go ahead on, on to case two, 55 year old female, radical hysterectomy, lymphadenectomy. Two weeks later, persistent uh, urinary frequency urgency and a CT was ordered. And this one actually has differential diagnosis, uh, potentially. Uh, is there anyone here who I can ask about a differential? Yeah, Tim, Tim and Thaddeus. We have the residents here too. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, it looks like a ovulated cystic mass. The pelvis looks like it could be a surgery. So you can speak yeah. up so they mm -hmm. can hear. <laughs> um, so it could just be, I mean, lymph angioma, um, could be two weeks, I mean, lymphocytes, lymph angioma, lymphocytes, lymph seal, sorry, maybe it's kind of a, you know, inclusion cyst, but I guess that can be in there. Uh, um, radical hysterectomy. So, anything else yeah, out? So, no, we see out that um, it was some type of IR lymphangitic study. <laughs> <laughs> you can do better than that. How about some cross sectional thing that you can do? Um, how about sampling the fluid? You could sample fluid. 
So he sampled the fluid and this is what you get. So notice that this fluid is actually clear. You can see through it, it looks yellow. Um, hopefully you didn't stick your needle in the bladder, but instead you stuck it in this other collection. And this is actually a typical appearance of a lymphocele, which is gonna usually occur a post-traumatic or surgical um, near a lot of lymphatic networks. So you're gonna see people who've had lymphadenectomies. Um, uncommonly, they are uh, symptomatic. So when they're symptomatic, they're either usually large or pushing on something else. Um, so it's well-defined cyst, uniformly low density, non-enhancing. The fluid is straw colored. And uh, what I send this for is not necessarily triglycerides because the triglycerides are gonna be absorbed at the level of the small bowel and dumped into the thoracic duct. So down here, what you wanna look for is the predominance of lymphocytes. The increasing number of lymphocytes is going to suggest that it is a lymphocele. So greater than 70% is the threshold on the most people use. If it's 80 and 90%, you almost certainly um, can confirm that it is a lymphocele. What IR treatments are available for lymphocytes? Um, could you just do the sclerosing agent? Absolutely. So drainage and sclerotherapy. Is there anything else? Um, sure. Okay. So lymphangiography as well can delineate the injury and potentially um, close it. So percutaneous sclerotherapy um, has been described I'm going back several decades with a variety of substances. Um, this is the same case followed up cross-sectionally with ultrasound. Uh, you see a needle in the uh, lymphocele. We have a drain. We inject our uh, sclerosin after we collapse the cavity. Then we injected the sclerosin and brought the cavity back up to size and then collapsed it. Uh, weeks later, this is what it looked like when we injected it to do a drain check. See that the cavity is essentially collapsed. Midline uh, bladder is back uh, into midline. And... Uh, very effective in that particular case. This is just a review from 2005 showing all the various studies of uh, sclerotherapy, all the different agents that have, could be done, and the success rates are quite high um, and not something that is uh, 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 experimental by any stretch of the imagination. It's well accepted and, and very effective. Um, nodal glue embolization is something else you could do. This is a gentleman who had uh, prostate uh, prostatectomy with uh, lymphadenectomy. You see multiple drains here because he had multiple um, loculated as well as uh, acidic fluid floating around. And all these little droplets where the arrows are pointing are almost like oil on water. The contrast that we use for lymphangiography is an oil, it's poppy seed oil, uh, functioning extract. And as it's landing on the water that's in the lymphocele, it's forming these droplets as you would see in oil and water. Um, they're also going close to the area where these drains are, so confirming the areas of leak. Um, we can then do gluing through the different uh, lymphatic channels to seal these up. This is what it looked like at the end. You see multiple leaks, multiple areas of injury. The lapidol itself is a pro-inflammatory contrast agent and will seal up about 50% of leaks even if you don't do an embolization. So depending on the patient, I may not even do an embolization and just inject lapidol. Uh, may even repeat that with lapidol. Um, and more often than not, you can have about an 80 to 90% success rate. Pilot societies, I'm just going to go through this qu uh, quickly. Um, historically, it was due to malignancy and tuberculosis. More commonly can now, I ask we see. Yes, of course. Um, on the last case, uh, with that large, um, uh, at what point do you do a sclerotherapy? Is there like a size cutoff? Or? Um, if it's symptomatic, then I'm going to treat it. If it's oh. not symptomatic, I'm going to leave it alone. Got it. Okay. So it's, it's really just about symptoms, nothing else. So um, Kyla Society is now you're going to see it, particularly if you're in a uh, tertiary center um, where they're doing aggressive retroperitoneal surgeries, whether aortic. Um, renal resections, et cetera, or malignancy. Patients typically going to have abdominal fillness, distension, weight gain, uh, dyspnea. They may be leaking fluid from drains. The fluid is going to be, again, turbid, opaque, with the triglyceride level, again, um, that we saw from pylothorax. So historically, again, diet modification, TPN, plus or minus octreotide can help. Um, the outcomes are fairly poor if they have a history of malignancy. Um, but if it's congenital or traumatic, the one-year mortality is actually not too bad. Um, I will mention that the incidence of calcitis is actually going up quite a bit. This is uh, just a graph that I compiled from four different uh, incidence papers uh, dating back to the 19 teens to the 1930s in New Orleans, all the way through MGH in the 1980s. Um, and I expect that it's probably increased more with um, radical uh, lymphadenectomies and um, retroperitoneal surgeries, as well as aortic uh, aggressive surgeries that we do now. So this was a 42-year-old male who had an incident only found 7-centimeter RCC, had a, a retro, had a left renal uh, radical nephrectomy. 
for six months, he had a chylus leak before he was referred to our center. And uh, you're going to see actually a fairly robust leak here just below the area of the clips. And um, just to kind of show you how robust it was, all of the lapidal leaked all around his spleen over a course of about an hour during the procedure. This patient had lost about 60 pounds of uh, weight over the course of those six months, um, was a very T and looked like a skeleton of himself. Doing the lapidol, and then we just went adjacent to those uh, surgical clips and glued around that area, um, stopped the, stopped the uh, leak, and he recovered quite well. Another example in a pediatric patient, Wilms tumor resection, and you see uh, doing a lymphangiogram here and uh, going up to the area where um, he had this. Uh, again, you see that leak uh, moving along. We actually changed out the lapidol for glue. We're able to glue it, and then a cone beam CT intraprocedurally uh, confirmed the leak as well as a uh, successful of the leak. So traumatic chylus societies, we don't think of it um, as a, a routine procedure anymore, but um, uh, as a routine IR procedure, but actually there's increasing evidence um, from multiple medical centers. There's a three-center paper from Korea at the very bottom, a paper from UPenn, and then our multi-center experience um, led by the University of Michigan. Um, and over a course of 19 manuscripts, I've seen 96 patients described. Um, when we see when it was described whether or not a leak was visualized, 60% um, 60 of the 82 patients um, had a leak visualized. So 73% leak visualization with lymphangiography. When you did lymphangiography alone, you had a 70% clinical success rate. Um, if it was combined with embolization, is a nearly 90% success rate. Obviously, this is going to be biased by positive uh, result uh, reporting. But nevertheless, the people who had lymphangiography alone, that was for diagnostic purposes, and you still see a fairly good uh, clinical success rate for a procedure that can be done with just a 25-gauge needle. So um, to me, I, I see that as very, uh, a very compelling way to potentially treat patients who may not have many other options. So in any case, um, I'm not going to go too much longer. Uh, so lymphatic fluid, it can accumulate in any of the serous cavities, whether pericardial, um, pleural, peritoneal, um, or form its own pseudo-cavity with a lymphocele. I think lymphatic IR is a rapidly growing field. We're treating a wider variety of disorders successfully. I've just talked about some of these things. I haven't talked about plastic bronchitis, protein alveolar proteinosis, uh, multiple uh, you know, protein losing enteropathy, and other things that we've actually started treating. Um, but I think the etiology for um, a lot of these disorders is a single most important factor to guide the workup and treatment. And I'm happy to take any other questions you guys have. Nope, Thank you. No, that was great. That was spectacular. Was perfect. I have a quick question. Um, so, are there like what are the consequences to sclerosing off your thoracic duct here? Is it like that we just form all these new channels, or like? So very, very, very good question. So um, there's only been one paper that's looked at uh, thoracic duct embolization and long-term effects of patients, mm -hmm. uh, two patients, um, and it had about uh, less than 10 percent. Uh, uh, consequences, with most of the consequences being uh, chronic diarrhea. Um, there was leg swelling as well. I will say that that, that those uh, patients also did have traditional lymphangiography, which is done from the feet with uh, cut downs. We don't do that anymore, so I think there's probably a lower incidence of uh, lower extremity swelling. Um, the diarrhea, uh, I can't completely uh, explain, although there may be some degree of decreased absorption of fats. Um, and some of these things. Um, and so is um, lymphatics actually embryologically are derived from renal structures and have multiple communications. We're not very good at finding communications. They're quite small. Um, so the one that we think of the most is at the left penis angle, which you have communications all along it. And my patients have done maybe between one and 200. have not had any uh, long-term uh, consequences in, in regards to um, any of these issues. Most of also years, fortunately, so. As far as more technique, like we're used to with somebody, and then um, are we going to do your time resolve? Whether it's going to twist 
or Thrive or whatever lingo you want to use in a lot for GE people, et cetera. Um, and you can do the time resolve. And it's going to look a lot like an MRCP, and you're just going to see this marching contrast. And then function that one sequence is the most important. It's going to show the flow dynamics. That's what we want to see. So we've got flow dynamic data from photosynthesis and combined ocean and better sensitivity than we'd have from conventional and geography. So it really helps uh, us with procedure planning. Any other questions out there? Question. What agent do you use for Just clear it there. I, you know, that's wrong agent. Um, you can use pretty any the most effective, um, but you have to make sure that there is no uh, leakage um, into any other places. But you can use a variety uh, of agents. It depends on location, depends on your patient as well. Um, some patients, you know, if they live far away, 12 plus hours away, you know, if they live in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, I would actually create little take home kits of iodine for them to do their own oh, wow. therapy at home um, and instruct them how to do it. Um, you know, because that's fairly uh, over the counter and you can just give it to patients, but I wouldn't give them like doxycycline or pure alcohol. Uh, but pure alcohol is, is my agent of choice. I find it to be the most effective. And more often than not, if it's a lymphocele now, I'll do the alcohol and I'll, uh, I'll just do a lymphane geography on that laterality and I'll, I'll attack it from both sides. And I'll do the lymphane geography while I'm letting it dwell. So I'll just inject the stuff and let it do its thing. Okay, thank you.